Can you make a living on a small farm? Honestly, I'm not so sure. That's what this episode's about. Coming up. Welcome to Farm Small, Farm Smart. I'm your host, Diego. D-I-E-G-O. Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Paper Pot Co. Paper Pot Co. is your source for all things farm efficiency. From Jang Seeders to Paper Pot Transplanters, we have a lot of tools to help make your time on the farm more efficient and more effective. We're trying to allow you to get in the field, get the work done quickly, and get out of the field so you can work on other things, like the business topics, which we'll talk about in this episode. But beyond just being a retail site, paperpot.co is also an information site. I'm trying to put more and more content onto that site, from podcast episodes to videos to webinars to blog posts. I've added a lot of content, and there'll be a lot of new content coming in 2020. So check out the blog at paperpot.co to read more about all the great things you hear about on this podcast. Today's episode is all about business. And it's not really the numbers or the nitty gritty side of the business that this episode's about. This is the reality of running a business. What does running a small farm really look like? How much money can you make? How stressful is it? What is life like owning a small scale farm? To help answer that question, I'm joined by Taylor Mendel. Taylor's a farmer in Vermont. She farms there with her husband, Jake, and they're on about one and a half acres under production. In this episode, she's going to talk about her real numbers, her real successes, and her real struggles around running that farm, which is CSA-based, and they also sell at farmer's markets. This episode was inspired by an Instagram post that Taylor did that asked this question, can you make a living on a small farm? What did she think about that? Why did she post that? And what does she think about that now? Let's explore that and other questions in this episode with Taylor Mendel. Taylor, as we're recording this, it's late in December. It's late in 2019. When you look back at the year that was 2019, how does it feel for you uh, as a farmer? There's a lot of feels at this time of year. Um, this season was really good for us in a lot of ways. It was our most productive season yet. We exceeded our wildest expectations for our income goals, which was great. Um, but we also, I think I used the word burnout for the first time this year. I've never actually said it about myself, but I definitely said that I hit burnout this year. How would you identify that? I think that's something that maybe people go through at times and they don't realize they're burned out when you finally could say it. And probably that means admitting it to yourself. What was what was burnout? Well, if I remember right, I think I just, I didn't want to do it anymore. I felt like I... I just wanted to have a day where I wasn't thinking about the farm or have a day where if somebody wanted to hang out, I could go hang out instead of staying home to thin carrots. Or um, I wanted to have enough energy to make dinner. I have a, a, a memory of sitting on the floor in the kitchen and feeling like I just couldn't stand up to stir whatever was cooking on the stove. Uh, it's just complete exhaustion. And and at a certain point, a lack of, of will to to do it again tomorrow, to play the game again tomorrow, as they say. You've been farming for a few years. Do you think that that was a few years of farming catching up to you? Or do you think it was really this year isolated to that was just catching up to you? It was probably all of it catching up. We've been farming for nine years, seven years running our own business. And I think at a certain point, the adrenaline runs out and 
you start really thinking about the realities of your your situation and you think, wait a minute, this has been feeling this way. I thought that by year seven, it would stop feeling this way. And it's harder to push through that feeling. And this year, we we put a lot of time into, we were asking this question of, okay, we have this much land. We can't really get any bigger. We we don't really have, we don't have kids, so we don't have anything um, that's really stopping us from going all out this year. So let's see what this small farm can do. And we we did, but I think seeing that number of what this small farm can do was was also a little discouraging for me and feeling like, okay, we gave it our all, but it still doesn't feel like enough. Um, I think for the first time I was thinking, I was thinking broader and more long-term about, about life in those, in those respects. Staying on that burnout for a little bit. Is that something that you think can be avoided? Not a hundred percent of the time, but do you think as a small farm, that has a limited amount of labor that is a self-employed business with a go season and then a slow season. When you look back at whenever you felt burnt out this year, can you avoid that next year, do you think? Or do you think it it will just creep up from time to time and it's more how you handle it? I think everybody probably experiences it at least once. And I think it's what you do with that experience that is important. So I'm really hoping it doesn't happen again next year. We're making a lot of changes. For some reason, the burnout really centered around these storage carrots. And um, there are so many emotions wrapped up in these storage carrots. And so we're trying to really look at what was the situation that made us feel that way and how can we get around it? Can we hire somebody else? Maybe we don't grow as many storage carrots. Maybe we do something else. You know, what was it about the storage carrots that was so defeating for us? Um, so yeah, I think, I think probably everyone's going to feel it, but I don't think I really, well, I don't think it's, it's a necessity. (laughs) I hope it's not. You know, on the flip side, now it's it's going into the middle of winter. Does it feel like now that as a farmer in an, you're in Vermont, you can get an extended break? Like it's like you stayed up twenty four hours for four straight days, and now you can sleep for you know three straight days. Does it feel like you can catch up over the winter months when you're going at it that hard over the summer in your area? I think that that is the interpretation. I think in reality, I think that's what people rely on, but I don't think it really works that way. I think there's some lingering stress and some, some damage gets done by going all out for, for us, it's three, about three months of our really intense season. Um, Yeah, I think it does catch up with you, especially in the winter. We're trying to extend our season quite a bit so that our cash flow is more manageable. So we go until the end of December and then we take about a month off and start up again. It is much slower. Can't do much because it's cold outside and um, it's dark, but we still are still are working, still thinking about the farm and, and the same level of intenseness. How much of this do you think is just your relative proximity to the farm? You guys both farm. You live on the farm. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. you're thinking on it 24, 7, 365 days a year, kind of exaggerating a little bit, but for the most part, because it's there. It's not where one of you has a nine to five and can step away and you get that bridge to the, you know, quote outside world. Or if you did have a job, you know, I remember when I had a full-time job, it was, you could leave that behind in some sense and you drove home and there was that separation. How much of this stress Mm -hmm. 
burnout, sense of maybe not getting a break is tied to that proximity to what you do to survive? We've been asked that a lot because we just moved to the farm two years ago. We've been here a little, little over a year and a half and it has actually helped my stress level quite a bit being here because we used to be not that far away between 10 and 20 minutes, depending on where we were living. And I found it to be incredibly stressful, especially in the in the winter, because you drive out to the farm to uncover plants or something and then realize, oh, the covers are still frozen. I can't do it right now. What do I do? Do I go back home? Do I wait here until I can uncover? And we were just spending so much time driving back and forth and saying, oh, no, it's your turn to go out. Oh, it's your turn to go out. Um, and just worrying about what was happening at the farm while we weren't there. Now it's much easier to just send someone downstairs to check on something or, um, oh, we have to take the dog for a walk. Great. We'll walk him out to the tunnels and check on him. And we also were very intentional about what our house feels like. We built a house on top of our wash pack. And there's kind of this transition moment as you go upstairs where downstairs looks very industrial and it's very clearly a workspace. But as you go upstairs, it transitions to feel very different. And we try not to bring like no farm clothes come inside, no boots come inside. We try to really separate business from home life visually so that we can turn off. And I I think that it's nice living at the farm and being able to say, oh, I forgot to bring kale home. Okay, I'll just walk downstairs and grab some. It feels like we're we're more fully living the life that we wanted to. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't think it's a big problem living here. What are your thoughts on mentally separating from the business? I try and preach this, you know, hey, when you're around family, other people doing something, you try and switch it off. So you don't miss that. And you don't want it all to be about business. But yet, I find myself having a very hard time switching it off, whether that's worrying about something that is is a negative or thinking about something that could be a positive. My mind is kind of always running around it. Given maybe not the proximity of where you're located, but just the fact that this is what you do. And in a lot of ways as entrepreneurs, our businesses define who we are. How do you find it trying to mentally shut off? Can you, do you not? Is that good? Is that bad? I'm pretty intense about thinking about the farm right now. Um, and I think that's where I'm at in this mostly in this calendar year. But we we definitely notice, especially now that we live at the farm, that the moment we leave the farm, we're able to shut off in a different way. We're able to go there. There's really something about leaving that we'll be at the farm on a Sunday and we'll say, oh, shoot, we meant to take Sunday off. But here we are sitting at the farm and we can't relax because as long as we're here, it feels like we can still be working. But we've learned that if we just get in the car and go somewhere, or if we change our clothes into something that we wouldn't normally wear on the farm, then we can leave. And maybe we would still talk about things, but we, things about the farm, but we are very intentional about saying, okay, it's okay to say, hey, let's not talk about the farm for the next hour or during lunch or while we're at this event. And I think we've gotten pretty good at, at knowing when we need to shut it down. Do you find that it's you both trying to um, maybe keep the other person on their toes in the sense of uh, if one person's thinking about it when you're off the farm and say, hey, we're off the farm, like enjoy that. Do you find that having a partner who who's that involved in the business that there's some accountability there for when it's break time, it's break time. If, if one person can't switch it off, maybe the other person is providing that a uh, loving reminder. Okay. Hey, 
it's our time now. I do. I don't know how people farm alone. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed that they can, but I really value, we tend to, when one person's freaking out about something, the other person isn't, or if one of us is, is feeling like, oh great, it's time to take a day off. And the other person can't stop thinking about those storage carrots. It can work really well to say, Hey, we're not worrying about that today. Remember, you know, we'll worry about when you get home. And on the flip side, it can be frustrating when you think, okay, I'm, I'm ready to take this day off and I'm ready to not think about it. And your partner is like, oh no, we can do it just really quick. We'll just go out for half an hour and we'll finish that thing and it'll be fine. And so I think I have a harder time with that where my expectation of having time off means something different sometimes than it means for Jake. And so we've learned that we really need to, the day before, we really need to say, okay, this is what my expectation is for our day off. And we've found that often it's different. And so we we try to talk about it ahead of time so that we do make the most of our time off. So knowing that, and thinking back to the storage carrots, I mean, just just chucking out some some thoughts. What what can you do to eliminate those times of high stress burnout? And maybe the carrots are just a metaphor for those times. Can you impose forced breaks in a farm season at the busiest time of year when it feels like? I don't have a time to take a, I don't have time to take a break yet in reality for health, the best thing to do would be to take a break. Yeah. I think that, I think that you can, but I think that you need to prioritize it intentionally ahead of time. So what we do is this time of year in the winter, we talk a lot about what we did or didn't get personally and what we wished we'd had, what we felt like we needed more of. And, and then we talk about how we can work that into the next season. So for example, this year, I felt like when I felt the most relaxed and the most like I was actually having time off was when we, we started to get into a rhythm of going out to lunch off the farm on Sundays. And that felt really good to me. Just leaving the farm was more rejuvenating than if I had spent the whole Sunday at home, in, I don't know, having people over for dinner or, or doing something that would normally feel like time off. For some reason, leaving the farm, even for just a few hours, felt really, really good to me. And so identifying that now and then knowing that that's something that we have to prioritize in the season is really important. We also try to, with the carrot situation, we try to have some really clear goals about what we're trying to achieve for the farm. And that way it helps with that decision-making process during the season, because we can say, wait a minute, are these carrots really important to those goals that we set up? And that's that's kind of why we kept pushing the carrots off is because they weren't. They weren't important to these goals that we'd set. So we pushed them aside and did something else. And I found it really helpful to be able to make that decision, but we still had the carrots hanging on in the background of our minds. And that was what got so stressful is that these these dangling stresses that that just wouldn't leave us alone. Um, and so then it's, what do you do about those stresses? Yeah, I'm there with you. I mean, it's one of those things, sometimes they can't be controlled and they're not, they're not things necessarily that you created. It, it, in this case, it could be weather created, it could be market created, it could be a customer issue. I, I think this whole idea of, of stressing around business is an important one because every entrepreneur is going to get there. And I find myself quite a few times a year getting to the edge where I can recognize that now where I'm I'm on the edge of losing it mentally and I can see how that manifests itself in the world like I'll be snappy is a is a parent and a husband and like I just won't feel good 
and I will tell myself in times like that, it's like, well, there may be a lot that has to get done, but I'm just going to shut it down. Like I'm just more or less taking the day off, taking a minimalist approach. I'll answer some emails, but beyond that, I'm not doing anything else today. In the height of a farming season, when you feel like every minute counts, every minute needs to be productive, and you feel maybe mounting stresses, when it's not Sunday, on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, do you feel like you could just one of those days for part of the day just say, you know what, today I'm just going to walk the dog and go for a hike, read a book, we're going to go off farm? Or do you succumb? And I don't say this in a bad way because I think in many ways we, we do succumb, all, all entrepreneurs, to that that pressure of like I can't waste a few hours when I feel like, and I've learned over time that you can keep working, but your productivity for those few hours might be lower and that may come up to bite you bigger in the, sometime in the future. And if you take some time off when you don't feel like you can, when you get back after it, maybe you're better than if you had kept going through it all. So when I say that, what comes to mind? What do you think? I think the, that that last piece that you said about when you're so tired and your productivity really starts to fall, I think that that is so important to recognize. And, and I do think it also takes a while to recognize when that's happening. And there's to the, the question about taking time off on a Tuesday, we, I know I couldn't right now, not during working hours, not before, you know, seven to seven to three, I couldn't do that because we have sm such a small crew and we really need all of us. We harvest every day for different markets, uh, Monday through Friday. And so we need all four of us here for that time period, but we do try to recognize there's that moment at the end of the day where you're like, okay, I could go out and do something, but I'm not going to do it well. And instead, I know that if I go do some yoga right now, my brain is going to be in a much better place to be able to do it better and faster tomorrow. And I can actually, instead of working on it today and tomorrow, if I'm if I'm a better person tomorrow, then I'm still going to get it done in the same amount of time. And that's been I th the, the part for me that has been important to learn is what are those things that are going to make me feel rejuvenated and like I'm taking care of myself. And I get, I get very stressed about using my time off wisely. If I have a couple of hours off, on a Tuesday, maybe Jake went to do CSA and I'm at home by myself. And I say, Ooh, I have two hours off. I've been really looking forward to having two hours off. I get this like time off paralysis where I feel like, Oh my gosh, I really, have, I, this is the only two hours off I get. I really have to use this wisely. And that has really taken me down a few times. I think I got better at it this year where I can, I can plan and say, okay, great. I'm not going to be doing CSA today. So as soon as Jake takes off in the van, I'm going to clean up from harvest and then I'm going to go grocery shopping because for some reason that's strangely calming and satisfying. Um, but I, I try to think of something specific ahead of time that I'm going to do. For me, there's something about being able to say that I'm doing it for me, that is so powerful. I think a lot of my life feels like I'm doing it because the farm is making me do it, do it, or my customers are making me do it, or um, I have to do it because the IRS is telling me I need to do it. And so for me to be able to do something because I wanted to feels really, really good. What are your thoughts on farming 
and the the importance of headspace in farming. I feel like I've long been an advocate that what attracts a lot of people to farming is the romanticism of being on the farm and the growing side of things. But what makes a farm stick around is being able to be mentally strong enough, adaptable, flexible to withstand the mental barrage that will come for months on end and not let up. And just hearing you talk here for the first 20 minutes, I mean, how much of you guys being around for nine years has been your ability to mentally manage this outside? If we remove everything else, the sales, the growing, how important is the mental? It might be the most important thing. For all intents and purposes, we didn't really know how to grow anything for the first few years. We learned to farm in California. So when we came here, it was completely different. Um, and so the for us, the the business side of things has really fascinated us. Um, and... I love books on productivity and organization and systems. And we've learned, we learned pretty early on that if we were going to be able to keep doing this, we needed our minds to be clear. There's your brain gets so cluttered so quickly thinking about, okay, what do I need to irrigate today? What am I supposed to harvest? Who is it for? How much? oh shoot, I can't harvest it because it didn't grow well. Why didn't it grow well? There's so many skills that have to be learned and so many things that need to be paid attention to. And so the the ability to see which things can be systematized or passed off, delegated to somebody else has been really crucial for us so that we can keep our whatever amount of brain space that we have, we can keep it available for the things that are actually important. Um, but then you also have to learn what are the things that are actually important. Is it is it learning to grow better or is it learning to run a business better? It's probably both, but which one is more important right now? Um, and that just constant reevaluating of priorities and um, and values is crucial. What are your thoughts on this? With this lure of small-scale farming and more and more people wanting to get into it, if we stick with the business side of things, which includes the nuts and bolts on paper through the mental side of actually managing the emotions, the stress, the processes that, that stack through time to run the business, can anybody do that? I say no. I say no. Why do you think that? Well, I think that from, you know, I mean, in my own experience, I definitely had a vision of what running a farm would be like. And it wasn't that. Um, and luckily, I liked what it was. And it it melded with my personality. But I think if I, I think a lot of people look at farming as this very romantic, beautiful, um, nourishing way of life. And I think it's really important to identify that maybe that's homesteading that you're looking at, or maybe that's gardening. Um, farming, actually running a farming business is quite different than just growing food and feeding people. Yeah, with you. And I, I recently talked to Chris Thoreau about this. You know, can anybody do this with, with say, microgreens? But really, microgreens are just an example of, of a farming business. And I think I diverge a little bit on views with him. And I'm, I agree with you. I think, sure, anybody could do this, just like anybody could be in shape. But look around most people aren't like we we all have the ability to do that but for some people you're just 
not wired that way or light it just the timing isn't right and this kind of ties into where i want to go next with the episode but with so many people looking to get in to farming i think it's necessarily it's a weed out game you know people are going to have to have that interest and go away just like any other business and what really made me want to talk to you was an Instagram post that you put up back in early November. And I'll, I'll read part of it because I think it's important for the context here. And it's, can you make a living on a small farm? Honestly, I'm not sure. I sat on a panel yesterday and spoke to a room packed full of movers and shakers in Vermont's food system and said just that. Our farm is looked at as, quote, successful. Sure, we're technically profitable but at what cost? The stress and uncertainty is more than many people can handle. And I'd argue that even profitable, small farms are not always sustainable or replicable. That was posted maybe six weeks ago. Hearing that again, thinking about that again, you, you wrote that. What do you think about that now? I wrote that. <laughs> I think everyone should read that. <laughs> Um, I, I, it's funny when you hear things that you wrote read back to you and you think, oh, no, uh, well, that's true. I think that's true. Um, I think hearing it back is, is funny. It's funny coming out of your voice, like from a podcast, your, your podcast voice. It feels like, oh, I wish I'd heard that on a podcast somewhere at some point early on. Um, I think that it's, yeah, I don't know what else to say. I think that it's exactly right. What drove that question? Like, why were you even thinking of asking, can you make a living on a small farm? I have a lot of thoughts. I don't want to put direct you or put anything in your head, but what was running through your head that drew that out? Well, it was that panel and what has since happened because of it. It was a panel of farmers who were asked to speak honestly and openly and uh, bluntly. I think we were encouraged to be brutally honest about the realities of our farming situations to a room full of folks who who really do have the ability to change things for farmers in, in my state. And it was the, the result of it was that many people have been emailing me or calling me and wanting, Oh, I heard what you said. And I, I so value, I haven't heard anything like that before. I'm, I'm so surprised. And, um, thank you so much for coming and sharing that perspective and, um, you know, offers to be on other panels and speak at conferences. And, and to me, I was so shocked that no one had heard that before. I don't think that I said anything particularly surprising, nothing. I didn't get really into details about life. I, I basically said that, we moved here and it was hard to get started and it was hard to find friends. And it was, it was just hard <laughs> really. And for me to hear that this room full of people who have been meeting for years and years had never heard that perspective was shocking. And I've since learned how little farmers are willing to share real numbers. Um, I've, I've been sort of co-opting conference workshops for years. I go to all the financial workshops and try to find out how much money the, the presenters are actually taking home or actually what, well, you know, what kind of life can I actually expect to, to provide myself a farmer and I haven't been able to 
get that number. And I think that that Instagram post came from that frustration of this lack of understanding of what it's like to be a farmer and um, how, how much is hidden from the rest of the world for some reason. It's interesting hearing that view. And maybe I'm a hundred layers too deep into this, but it's it's surprising to me that more people hadn't heard that because I feel like that that's an assumption uh, at this point. Like, uh, I think it's an assumption, but I think they don't want to see it. Right. It's just hope. Like, I want this to work, so it should work. Yeah, and and to be a farm that is is often in media as an example of look there's young farmers they're doing it i think that people kind of glaze over the other side of it you know they're doing it but what does that actually mean do they have health insurance can they have a kid you know the 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 details are sort of washed over being in business and not not closing up shop has has become a term of success or a a, um, metric of success. I think there's a lot of met- metrics of success, whether that's fulfillment in life through land regeneration, to providing food for a community, but there's always going to be, by definition, if you are running a business, financial success. After nine years of farming, seven years of doing it on your own, do you feel like today your farm is solely financially successful? Yes, um, I do. And I'll, since, since I'm a proponent of sharing numbers, I'll share my numbers from this year. So we farmed on an acre and a half outdoors, plus an acre in cover crop and a quarter acre in high tunnels, unheated. And so about a, an acre and a half in production. And we grossed somewhere between one hundred and seventy and one hundred and eighty thousand dollars. And I mean, that's that's a number. What's really important is our net or our take home, which I've learned is very difficult to actually express because, you know, our farm pays our mortgage and our electricity. And um, so it's hard to to get a full picture of how much money we are actually taking home. Um, but we made enough money this year that we took care of ourselves during the season. We paid our employees well. Um, we have enough money at the end of the year to make some significant investments for the farm for next year, plus put some money into our Roth IRAs. Um, however, we got to burnout this year. So next year, we are going to hire another employee for the main season and hopefully that will help take some time out of our schedules so that we can not work quite so much next year and so that we we've, we've done our budget for next year and the numbers should still work out with that extra person but i'm definitely i'm definitely curious to see what would happen if we had a kid or if you know because if we have a kid that means that one of us is out of the field so would we have to replace that time by hiring somebody else um or would we pay for child care can we pay for child care so those are the questions that i'm asking right now so yes this year we were financially successful does that mean that we can continue at that same gross number and still take care of ourselves in the future? I don't know. First, thanks for sharing that and being open about that. I think that it is important. And I think a lot of farm businesses don't know their numbers or they know them, but they maybe interpret them in a way that isn't accurate. So you could feel like you're making a lot of money, but is that money actually flowing through to your pocket? And for me, I mean, one thing that I I found helped, and this is still true to this day, like I write myself a check for running paper pod. And for the longest time, the check I wrote myself each month was $1,500. Like that was my pay 
for running it for a month, for years. And not a huge amount, but something I tried to implement early on from day one to say, hey, I'm getting paid for doing the labor versus just working and saying I'm growing the business and being able to, to look at the business and say, okay, well, here's how the business is growing. Sales go up, the business bank account changes, inventory levels change. Like there's a lot of metrics you can see to say, hey, we're we're getting bigger. But it 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 doesn't always have that personal connection. So me just writing that check was helpful. And I've often tried to tell like small farms, like if you feel like you're you're challenging here, like write yourself a hundred dollar check a month or something like that, just to say, Hey, I'm getting paid for this. Like there is an exchange. Do you guys, it's not a be all end all for all situations, but do you write yourself a check? I'm curious. Absolutely. We, we base our entire business on how much money we need to make monthly. So when we create our budget this time of year, we figure out how much money do we need to survive this year. And then we figure that number out with all of our our bills, our monthly expenses. And then we say, okay, well, how much money do we need to thrive this year? Maybe I want to do a monthly massage or maybe, um, you know, Jake's going to sign up for that men's basketball league. And then we add that money in and see what that shakes out to. And it has been, it's been growing every year. So when we first started writing ourselves monthly checks, it was $1,000 a month, but that's for both of us. So 500 each. And then that's grown. So last year it was 1,500. And again, most of our expenses are more like um, our car, mostly personal car insurance, health insurance, groceries, things like that. Our farm covers a lot of our main expenses. Um, but for next year, we're going to be paying ourselves 1800 a month. And does it feel good to be able to step that up? It feels good. For me, it's not necessarily what the number is, but it, for me, it feels good that we're prioritizing ourselves and we're acknowledging that if we can't pay our bills, then we can't run our farm. So we need to make sure that our farm at least allows us to pay our bills because if not, then what's, what's the point? Given that you're a CSA based farm, you you sell at farmers markets. How do you find forecasting and predictability accuracy for putting these numbers together? It's not like you're selling to ABC grocery store and you know, okay, each week they're coming in with $5,000 order times 52. Okay. There's $250,000 in sales. Farmer's market, do you just assume, Hey, here's what we've done. We think we can do that or a little more CSA. Here's what we've done. We think we can do that and a little more and then budget off that. How do you predict when those market streams are very variable? It's, it's been tricky for sure. So we have, we have tried to, so taking, taking the budgeting to the next step. So we figure out how much money we need and then we figure out how much money the farm needs. And that number is then what we go out to match our marketing plan to. So if we raise our personal income to 1800 a month, and we give raises to all of our employees, then that means, okay, now we have to make $150,000 in this year. How are we going to do that? So then we look at our marketing streams and we say, okay, well, the most reliable of our three marketing streams is CSA and we need it to be reliable. And so we work really, really hard on CSA member retention rates because for us to be able to depend on a certain amount of money is, is it's vital. So um, we're at about an 87% retention rate right now, which 
is is great because it means that I know if I open up our CSA in January, I have a pretty good idea at this point of how many people are going to sign up. And I've already talked to those people and I already know that if I nudge them, if we need the money and I nudge them, they'll sign up. Um, but that's taken, that's taken five years or so to get to a, a group of people who support us in that way. And we, we so, so value having that, um, farmer's market. So last year we, we were kind of averaging maybe a thousand to twelve hundred dollars at a, our farmers market each week, and based on last year's numbers, so we we said we were going to have to make one hundred and forty seven thousand dollars last year, and or la- by last year I mean this year, two thousand nineteen, and the place that and and we hadn't made anywhere near that much money before. And so we said, okay, well, I think the place where that growth is going to happen is not in CSA. It's not in wholesale. I think it's going to have to be at farmer's market. So knowing that we had to make however much more, I think it was $10,000 more at farmer's market, knowing that we put a lot of effort into figuring out how we were going to make more money at farmer's market. So we rebuilt our stand. Um, to make it look different, we we did a little bit more rebranding and um, really tried to plan for that, and it it worked. So we this year averaged closer to two thousand dollars a market, and hopefully we can stay at that number. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that we do have a pretty good idea of how much money is going to come in from our three streams, but we also I think the more important part is that we know where we need to make more money and that's where we put all of our attention. So when we were neglecting those storage carrots, it was because we were putting attention into our farmer's market stand because we knew, okay, we have to hit $2,000 this week. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to make that money that we said we needed to make in order to take care of ourselves. If that makes sense. It does. It makes a lot of sense. I think it's really well thought out. It it's it cycles through nicely. If you don't mind my asking, how old are you now? I'm 32. Okay, 32. Mm-hmm. 32. This feels good. If you want to do this for the next 20 years, let's assume you do. Do you think this all works? The farm model, the financial model. Like, can this get you to quote retirement? the end. I, many people listening to this, many people who want to get into small scale farming are relatively young. They're my age, which is almost 40 and younger. And there's some amount of income that can work now. When you're 20, you can get by with not a whole lot. But as you get older, really those needs go up, maybe because you have kids, maybe because eventually you want to stop working and relax a little bit and have some money for savings. And I don't think there's very much thought going into as, as industry as a whole being small-scale farming of what does the future look like, long-term future, like my future when I'm 50-plus Am I still doing this? What does that look like? How does that mean I'm tractor-based or tool-based or labor-based? And what does the financial picture look like in the long term? Because so much of farming is go, 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 go now. And it's stressful now that that's where you focus. You focus on the pain point, which is the immediacy of the situation. And I really worry that not enough people are looking way ahead and saying, okay, how does this year play a part of a year, 20 years from now? Like it needs to make a contribution then now. 
how does it? Maybe it's not, okay, we put a bunch of money in the bank for them. Maybe we're just saying we're going to grow the business and then we're going to sell it or we're going to have all employees run it. But this general concept of 32 to 52, what do you think about that? How are you guys approaching that? We are thinking long term. We we do a couple of different things. Um, something that I I th- I think a lot about how things are going to change once we have kids, if we have kids, and so I sort of see myself as transitioning out of the field at a certain point. I'm also extremely injury prone, and I just have this feeling that my body isn't going to last as long as everybody else's. Um, so I want to pay attention to that and recognize that our employees are probably going to stay the same younger age and I'm just going to get older. Um, so I'm, I am thinking about, I, we're trying to focus a lot on what that number continues to be of how much money do we need to make to thrive. And that number is going to go up and we're going to need to keep pace with that. So I'm trying to be very realistic about that and say, okay, if at a certain point our farm can't keep up with that number, that means that probably I am going to take in some work from off the farm. And do I feel okay about that? What kind of work is that going to look like? What kind of work would I still feel fulfilled in, but, but connected to the farm? And how is that going to look with our employees. Um, So we, we think about that piece of what if the farm can't provide. We also, every, every young person who comes to visit our farm, I tell them to read this book called The Broke Millennial, which is, it's a fun, it's a fun book um, written in with a lot of like, literally, and, you know, a lot of millennial jargon, but it's, the the point of the book is very serious matter where she lays out the difference between starting to save for your retirement when you're in your 20s versus when you're in your 40s and that really shook me when i first started reading it because i was like oh shoot we we're in our 30s and we just opened our first Roth IRAs. And that means that we've lost a lot of earning potential in a retirement account. And so I'm really encouraging people to start saving for retirement, no matter what age they are, and no matter how much it is that they're able to put into those accounts. Um, and I'm, I'm also hearing that the there's this traditional thought of as a farm, we're putting in money into the equity of our land, the equity of our equipment and our buildings. But I look at our farm and I'm not sure what the resaleability of it is. I'm not sure this building that we've built to work and live in is very specific to our operation. And could I resell this piece of land and keep it as a farm? Would somebody it's really built to our personalities and can we find somebody who would want to buy this business? I don't really know. And so I'm hesitant to put my retirement on this hope that I can sell my assets. I'm not, I'm not sure that I will be able to in the way that I would want to. So I'm trying to look at this business as a traditional business and not necessarily what has traditionally been a farm business. And I'm trying to think about retirement plans for my employees. Um, Yeah, just really thinking a lot about that. (laughs) Yeah, I I would argue that the equity in a small business, be it farming or not, is, uh, well, there's obviously some, by definition, in the sale of the assets at the end of the day, which are probably going to be more than when you started. But it's, the equity is in the the brand of the business. So the equity in your farm, I see it as part would be, hey, we don't sell the farm. We just don't work as much on the farm. And we have other people run it and we manage it and we just take a share of the profits because this is what 
took us 40 years to build. Like that's how I see a small farm business as a part. I agree with you. Not all a part of a retirement plan is it's we step aside and we don't do the work. We just own. Yeah. When you think about a, a small scale farm, I mean, market farms, like the JM style market farms that most people identify with. Are these farms, is this, let me re-ask, is that business model of these farms built for the long term? I can look at a lot of companies and say, okay, like they could be 60 year businesses. Obviously there's black swans, technology changes, those types of things. But there's certain things like once they're in place, like they run banks, for example. And you look at a small scale farm that has a relatively low amount of labor running it, it's five people or so. And you're selling to CSAs, you're selling to farmers markets. Is that a 30 year business model? Do you think? I think there's a lot of factors that we still need to see what happens. So I think there's there's a lot of support right now in many areas, not all areas, but there's a lot of consumer support for small farms right now. That needs to continue. Um, I think that food prices will need to rise. Food prices haven't changed in 15 years, but our inputs have all gone up with inflation. So I think the profitability needs to go up in in whatever way that means. But I, I think it is possible for maybe not everybody, but... Um, let me rephrase that. I recently was at a dinner with this guy who does financial planning and support for farmers through this program called Farm Viability. And I was asking him this same question. Does he think that an acre and a half can provide a living for people for a career? And he said that of the business plans that he's looked at, he feels like his favorite model is the small scale owner operator size. He says that he thinks that there's something about being as involved as you are if you're running the business and working in the field, that you're able to keep track of expenses in a different way. You're able to see where improvements need to be made in a different way. And so he has this, this confidence in a small scale farm that encourages me. I mean, I haven't seen there, there's this big wave of new farms right now that are that market gardener scale, but we haven't, none of us have farmed for long enough to know if it works and of the people I know who are farming on that scale, there are a lot who have off-farm income in some way, shape, or form, which is fine. I think that that's, it's important to realize that most farms do have off-farm income. Um, but I think that, that, that that's another piece that needs to be acknowledged for folks who are thinking about getting into it, is that maybe you can make a long-term living off of an acre and a half. Um, or maybe you need to supplement it with off-farm income. And that is probably a reality for most people. That was rambling. Maybe I answered the question. No, no, it's good. I think it's a, it's a fair, it's a fair answer. And a lot of this is rambly thinking. I mean, cause there aren't clear pathways or, Hey, look at this model. And then there are examples. Like you pull some person out. Okay. This person's Elliot Coleman started market farming back in the early eighties. He's still around. Okay. Well, that's one. But there's thousands of these market farms out there. And when I look at a lot of the models out there, I mean, the models that I see on the surface, like if I'm picking these to say, okay, this is, this is what I like, or I would want to be involved in. I, I look at models like Bear Creek, 
Vitruvian. I think Ray Tyler at Rose Creek's going in that direction of specialization around one crop and being able to move that to in volume to a lot of different larger scale beyond the individual consumer market streams in their area. Because that allows you to get big enough to mechanize somewhat to take some of that stress off. You can hire labor so it becomes a little bit more of a management than a work. But obviously that's not going to work in every market. And I mean, when you look at the market that you have in Vermont doing, I think you said about 180 gross, I mean, how much more could you realistically push that? If you guys said, we want to have a child and that's going to require an additional $50,000 in gross, which translates down to $30,000 in net. And that's what we need. Could you do that where you are at? I don't think so. No, not to that extent. But part of it is our land base. We really, well, we have, we only have two and a half acres that are usable on our current property. And we've talked a lot about do we do we get bigger do we expand but it feels like for us to expand we would have to get more land and to get more land it means that we'd be moving equipment back and forth or we'd have to move our entire operation and it doesn't it doesn't feel right for us um i think it's it's important to know what feels right for your personality and for us it feels we love the small scale like really getting nerdy on efficiencies of small space and so in our situation if we needed to make another 50 growth probably that's when we would make the change of hiring out my labor and i would find income elsewhere we have talked about, okay, well, could we do a value add or could we do workshops on the farm? Could we do some events or something that way? But every time something gets discussed, we think, eh, it's not really, we're not excited about that. And if we're not excited about it, then we're not going to do a good job of it. So we we keep shutting shutting down those ideas. But Vermont to Sometimes I'll hear an idea, like we have friends up in Nova Scotia, Abundant Acres Farm, and they have this really cool kind of pop-up grocery store model. And I I keep thinking about it and I think, oh, that would be so cool for our area. And we could do this and we could do this. And, and Jake keeps saying, but remember, they have this population base that's like their one city is as big as our entire state. We just don't have the people to buy that amount of food. And I think, okay, that's right. That's right. We need to, when you're looking at other farms models and you're thinking, oh, well, it worked for them. It's really important to remember what's your land base look like and what's your market look like, because odds are they don't match up. hundred percent agree. And this is kind of the maybe sad reality for some people is that this puts the glass ceiling in on what your, and I don't mean you personally, but a person's farm could be. And I'm a big proponent of you design a business to support the lifestyle that you want to live. And if you do that at age 20, I mean, really you should be thinking into the future, but I don't blame a 20 year old for not thinking about what they're going to want their life to be like at 40. I, I just don't think most people have that perspective. It's just, that's not realistic. But if you start a farm at 20 and you grow it and you realize, oh, at 30, this is what my life needs to look like. I got married. I want to have kids. Income needs to go up. The 
the real reality might be just what you said. Our market won't allow us to get bigger. Our land won't allow us to get bigger. Our availability of labor won't allow us to get bigger. And that's probably a hard pill for some people to swallow, but I think it's one of those things. It It is what it is. And it's you accept that and say, okay, this is what the farm can do. We can't push it more. Let's just run it well, make it as profitable and as lean as possible. And then we get outside income or we look to diversify in some other way. Or you do what you alluded to you could do. You, you pick up shop and you move, which comes with its own set of problems and unknowns. So it is, it's tricky. And while I think the market, the model of market farming is there, and I think it's proven, okay, this can be profitable. Well, if I make $5,000, on $10,000 in gross sales, that's profitable, but so what? And if I make $250,000 on $500,000 in sales, okay, that's a different business. So it just is product market fit, business fit. What do you want your life to look like? And I know that's something you've really been pushing a lot in what you're doing with this habit farming and seeing that on Instagram is tying in the business to the personal side of things because these small scale farms are intimately personal and are very much reflections of the people who own and work in the businesses. And if they don't align, like you've talked about a lot in this episode, there's going to be problems. Absolutely. If you had a Vermonter come up to you who was 20 and they said, Hey, I'm going to start a market farm. This is going to be my thing. I'm going to make my income off of it. What financial business advice would you give them? Not, well, here, grow these crops or, you know, look at this model. But like when you think about the business side of things, a lot of what we've hit on in this episode, what would be the things you'd really want somebody new to this to know when it comes to numbers, when it comes to planning, when it comes to running the business? I would want them to know how much money they need to make rather than how much money they think they can make. Because I think having that motivation of, all right, I know I need to make this much money. And that means by, by July, I should be at this number. And if you're not, it, it gives you the opportunity to look up and say, wait, why isn't it going the way I thought? What do I need to do to turn things right now? Or what am I not seeing? Um, for our first years, it was just, oh, let's grow things and let's try to sell them. And then we'll see how much we make in the end of the year. And once we shift our shifted our perspective to thinking, okay, in order to live, this is what we need. How are we going to make that? It really turned things around for us. And I think if we'd started out that way, it would have been, it would have been pretty helpful. When you think about the farm business beyond a subsistence model of it pays the bills I need it to pay today without that forward thinking in there, that is so important, like it needs to pay the bills, not just now, but allow me to grow as a person in business into the future. If that person asked you, said, hey, give me the straight dope on this. Can you make a living on a small farm? What would you say now? I would say, what does that mean for you to make a living on a small farm? Does it mean that, you know, I know plenty of farms who have been successful and are now almost to retirement age, but in order to do it, they were maxing out credit cards. They were, um, you know, they didn't go out to dinner for 10 years. Is that, is that how you want to do it? Because if it is, then that's awesome, but commit to that. Or do you value being able to go on a vacation every year? If you do value that and own that, but put a number to it. 
um, what are you, what does making a living mean to you? And really think about if that's possible on your scale, because I do, it is possible to make a living on a farm, but what making a living is to me is going to be different than what it is to anybody else. Well, well said, love a lot of what you're talking about in this episode, a lot of what you've been posting online. It's obvious you're doing a lot of thinking about this, this winter. You're also doing a lot of writing about these subjects. Can you talk a little bit about what your goal is with some of the the recent blog posts that you've had and where people can go to read those posts? That that is the question. What is my goal? I don't know. Um it's it's been funny. I I started doing it just because really it, the jumping off from that panel that I was on that we talked about earlier, I it was so shocking to me that people weren't talking about this stuff that I said, all right, I'm doing it. I'm just going to make a blog because I don't know what else to do. Um, And if there's anything that I've read that could help people, then great. I'll put it, I'll put it up on this blog and we'll see what happens. And I didn't expect anybody to read it really. Um, But they have, and I think it's really hit people in different ways. And as I've been talking to people, it's hit everybody differently. And so it's really interesting for me to ask other people what has struck them personally, because it's some, for some people it's, they think, Oh, you're building a community of women farmers. That's so great. But to other people it's, Oh, you're sharing your business review tips. That's so great. And for other people it's, Oh, you're talking about how um, how somebody recently said, oh, you're talking about poverty on farms. And for me, it hasn't necessarily been any one of those things. Um, It's been more of a, uh, see, I don't even know. I don't know where it's going (laughs) to, I don't know where it's going to go or if it's going to become anything in particular, but for me, it's just a way to share. And I have had more, the best things I have done for my farming business and my personal life have been times where I've gone away from the farm with other farmers and talked, talked in real terms about what's going on for us. And for me, habit farming is trying to share that feeling with more people, trying to tell more people that, hey, I realize that you feel alone and that there are so many crises happening on your farm right now and you feel like you're failing and there's no one out there to help you. And I want you to know that you're not the only person feeling that way. You're not alone in this. Um, I also want people to feel like they can step away from their farm and take some time for themselves. I want to give people the, um, the opportunity to remind themselves that farming, their farm is not everything they can leave and come back and the farm will still be there. Um, I just, I want to remind people that there is a community of folks out there trying to do the same thing. And it's not, we're not all in this trying to solve all of society's food problems alone. And if somebody's interested in reading that, where would you direct them? Uh, well, right now I have a, a free website because I don't want to pay for it. So the the web address is www.habitfarming.weebly.com. Yeah, it's really great. I think you're exploring a lot of interesting topics, you know, sharing your experience. And then also uh, I, I see it as you sharing, but also guiding, you know, people that might be looking for answers while also providing, hey, here's some jumping off points to start conversations and connect people. One thing I've learned a lot of in the past year from visiting a lot of larger farms and doing episodes on things like farmer depression is there isn't a lot of talk amongst farmers for whatever reason beyond just, hey, how's your crops doing? What's going on in the field? And I think you kind of saying what you're doing 
starting this blog echoes that in the small scale farming space. For whatever reason, when farmers talk, there isn't a lot of the awkward, difficult, hard conversations. And I hope that this podcast, your blog helps get some of those awkward conversations going because we know they're on everybody's minds. We know they're stressing everybody out. Talk to people who are in that same boat and and try and work through those things and not let it boil over or have businesses fail or have marriages fail or families fail because it, it maybe feels taboo or awkward to bring these things up. So thank you for putting yourself out there and being honest about all of it. And, and hopefully that kickstarts some conversations. It's really needed. Thank you. That's, that's nice to hear. Um, and I would say for anybody who is feeling like, oh, no, there's nobody in my community who wants to talk about these things or who I could turn to. I think there are. I think as you start talking about these things and opening yourself up, you realize that there are all these other farmers who you look up to as being on top of their stuff. And you find out that they they feel just as confused and stressed out as you do. And so one thing that I'm trying to do here is I'm hosting monthly potlucks at my house and it's probably going to be women farmer based in the beginning because I've found that having space for women to talk amongst each other is really important too. I think everybody needs to talk more about this, but women especially because our work, especially when kids get involved, shifts quite a bit. And I've found that as women start having babies, they feel very, very isolated. And so having, I'm trying to create some groups where, um, where there's a community to rely on. But I think that that model of having regular meals with farmers is really, really important. And it feels a little bit weird to reach out to farmers in the beginning, but I will say from personal experience that everybody is excited about it and is very thankful to, to, be, to be asked to come over for dinner. Yeah, I think you're that example of, you know, somebody should really do something about that. And then you realize that somebody is me and you did it. So now it's great to hear. I'll be sure to link to that and your Instagram where people can connect with you. But thanks for taking the time to chat, Taylor. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and have a good new year. You too. Thanks, Diego. There you have it, Taylor Mendel of Footprint Farm and Habit Farming. If you want to follow along with everything that Taylor is doing on Instagram or on her blog, check out the links listed below in the description for this episode. While you're doing that, be sure to reach out to Taylor on Instagram and give her a thank you or let her know your thoughts on this episode. I think she was very honest and forthright. And if that resonated with you, let her know. She took some time out of her day to share that. And if it helped, saying thanks is just a way to give back a little bit. If you want to let me know what you thought of this episode, hit me up on Instagram at Diego Footer. If you want more episodes like this, uh, more topics like this, if you want to be on the show, that's the best place to reach me. Thanks for listening to this one. There'll be a lot more business-focused episodes coming up here in 2020, so stay tuned for those ahead. That's all for this one. Thanks for listening. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.